Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa tabib nufusina Wa habib qulubina abil qasim muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam La siyama baghiyyat Allah Ruhi wa arwahu al-alameen Liturab maghdamih al-fida Assalamu ala al-Husayn Wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين أمرور أمرور على جدث الحسين فقل فقل أعظمه الزكية يا أعظم ما زلت من غطفا ساكبة الروي يا صلى على محمد وعلى محمد صلى على محمد وعلى محمد يا بعزة السيسيز الإسلام السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بعض من أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بالحسين وأولاد الحسين وأصحاب الحسين عليهم أفضل الصلوات والتحيات It is my great honor and pleasure to be among you الحمد لله here in this part of the world and thank you very much to the introduction I hope I don't disappoint you with this uh, great introduction that I don't deserve it. Uh, tonight is the second night of uh, the month of Muharram, but uh, the first night that I'm having an opportunity to talk to you. I'm here only for a few more uh, days and nights. As the brother mentioned that if anyone has any question or queries or any discussion, I'm available here 24-7, but not 24-7, 24-7 times three perhaps on Wednesday I'll be leaving uh, Stockholm to Copenhagen so by all means I'm at your service if there is anything the time also is very short this uh, humble uh, but very sincere gathering in fact reminded me of Sydney in 1993-94 uh, back then the English programs were very uh, uh, very few I can tell you that perhaps uh, the gathering that we had was the only one uh, that was an English uh, an English program. Everywhere else you would go, naturally, Arabic, whether Iraqi community, Lebanese community, Iranian community, Afghani, Urdu, and still. But I can tell you that, alhamdulillah, since then now, definitely the English programs and lectures during Muharram are much more than other languages. And uh, there is more demand for it. Almost all centers have realized that if they want to keep the next generation, there is no choice but to have English program. I was so delighted to see that the brother was giving lecture in Swedish and reading majlis in Swedish. Alhamdulillah, may the, oh, the heart of Imam Mahdi Ajahn be pleased with him and with, with all of you. Have no doubt that the future is yours and you are the future makers of Muslims in this country. There was a sad reason and sad news and sad event that your parents, mainly I assume that many of you are migrants, that they had to leave their countries of origins, their, their homelands. But subhanAllah, the religion of Islam is much more dear than anything else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you wanted to ask us voluntarily how many of you are willing to go to Sweden to reside there and preach Islam, how many of your parents, how many of us would accept you to come here? But 
God has to find his own mysterious ways to send us here for the second and the third generation. And let me tell you one thing before I get to my uh, talk, in fact, my experience from Australia, which I assume that uh, by and large everywhere else is the same. In 1995, uh, I was in an official gathering with some of the officials from the immigration, uh, you know, in Australian immigration. And a senior officer, he mentioned something, perhaps it slipped out of his mouth, and I'd like to share it with you. And that was, our target group is not the first migrant generation. We may even provide facilities for them. Uh, in Australia, we have Centrelink, things like uh, you know, social benefits that they give to the communities. Our target is not the first generation. Second and the third generation is the target group for us that we are hosting the migrants. So at the same time, we have to be careful and we have to understand is that the heritage that our ancestors had passed it to our parents and they passed it to us, it is our obligation to maintain it and pass it to the next generation, inshallah. I have absolutely no doubt that time will come, inshallah. As you can see it in different parts of Sudan now, there are majalis held for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Inshallah, time will come that this majalis will be more and the call of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Ali Waliullah will be heard everywhere. This is the prediction of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and there is absolutely no doubt about it. And the Prophet had said this when only him and his wife, Sayyid Khadija and Imam Ali Alayhi Salam, were the only three people praying on earth. Back then, the Prophet said that time will come. There is no house made of uh, wabar or made of wool or made of uh, clay but the call of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the shahadat al-thalitha Ali waliullah inshallah will be heard from it. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As a matter of fact, this is one of the main reasons that every year we are commemorating Muharram. If somebody asks you, as I've been asked many times by non-Muslims, that Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the grandson of the Prophet, was martyred, killed brutally more than a millennium back. Why is it that every year still you Muslims you weep, cry, and commemorate as if it had happened yesterday? Why is it that you are so insisting Adam and every year to commemorate it? I tell them that it goes back to the reason for the same reason that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have been commemorating it. For us, as Muslims, we are expected to follow the footsteps of the Holy Prophet of Islam and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt What happened in Karbala was Imam Hussain as he made it very clear himself, he stood against the tyranny of his time for the purpose of safeguarding Islam from being deviated, perverted from the right path a deviation that took place right after the demise of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Khilafat went to the wrong direction, and steady, steady, that angle, in the beginning people could not notice the, uh, that it's going off the right path. But after half a century, at the time of Imam Hussain the deviation had, and the gap between the right Islam and the perverted Islam had become so big that there was no any other solution for it other than sacrificing the blood of the heart of Imam Hussein for the sake of reviving Islam, for the sake of resurgence of Islam, for the sake of waking up, giving such a, uh, what do you call it, uh, chalk observer to the Muslim community so that they wake up. Everybody asked this very important question that what? The grandson of the Prophet was killed by the so-called Amir al -Mumani. Remember, Imam uh, Yazid was referred to as Muawiyah, as Amir al -Mumanin, Khalif al Rasulullah. So people could not fathom this any longer, that Amir al Mu'minin, Khalif al Rasulullah, the vice president of the Prophet, has killed the grandson of the Prophet. Not only he himself, even his infant, a, a six-month-old baby, and they had taken the family of the Prophet as captives, that was definitely a turning point in the history of Islam, to wake up the then Muslim community, which was really sort of completely asleep and dead. 
The Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, since then, all of them, they were insisting the riwayat that we now read it after more than 1,000 years and we see that how much rewards are promised in the riwayat for reading Majalis of Imam Hussain mentioning, crying for Imam Hussain, making people cry for Imam Hussain, even tabaki, which means even if you cannot cry for Imam Hussain, at least you got to feel grieved and have sympathy for the uh, tragedy of Karbala so that you can also join gradually, steady, steady, you can join it's also that the revolution of Imam Hussain is maintained and remains always alive the teachings that Imam Hussain wanted the Muslim community to learn they don't bury in Islam we have a similar situation uh, at the time of Imam Musa al-Kazim a, a tragedy took place as a, a Fakh tragedy is known in the history interestingly the name of the uh, group leader of that uh, battlefield is also Hussein ibn Ali Hussein ibn Ali known as Shaheed al-Fakh because it took place in an area and now it's in uh, Mecca today nearby Mecca and they were all I actually visited their, their area in Mecca even though the Saudi regime had completely eradicated it but uh, Historically, we could have spot it out, and we went there. There were a group of people led by Hussein ibn Ali, who is a descendant of Imam Hassan Mushtaba alayhi salam, against the tyranny of their time. They had a very bloody war there, and they were all uh, slain and massacred. All right? Quite similar to the tragedy of Karbala, in a sense, if you might if you want to say that. But nothing much is mentioned in the history about it. It was more of a Re uh, revolting against the tyranny of the time and that's it so many such things happen but why especially Ashura and Karbala has revived and re remained alive number one because the leader was very different from others and number two it was the struggles of Ahlul Bayt one after the other for example Imam Baghr had made another had made a vow in his time and after his martyrdom that even Imam Sadr continues that that in Mena where all Muslims from the, the then Islamic world they get together for a Hajj pilgrimage Imam Bakr had made a vow and, and was spending had dedicated some money that every year Majalis al Husseini had to be mentioned and revived in, uh, in Mena especially in Mena that people from all around the globe they get together all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt they had poets and those poets that they were uh, reciters uh, as we say today that the duty of those reciters was on any occasion reading Majlis for Abu Abdullah Hussein. If you get a chance later on uh, and I saw last night that Mafati al Jalal Alhamdulillah is translated in Swedish language Alhamdulillah as well have a look at it all Islamic occasions you see that on, if not on the top, second top of the list of the agenda of that occasion is Ziyarat Imam Hussain even on the occasion of Mab'as on the occasion of Ghadir Khum any Islamic occasion you see Ziyarat Abu Abdullah Al Hussein is on the top of the list for the reason that had it not been the struggle of Imam Hussain had it not been the, the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and the loyal family of Imam Hussain nothing would have remained from Islam today there was no Shia Sunni any longer. There was no Muslim, in fact. So not only the followers of Ahlul Bayt as the followers were indebted to the uh, struggle of Imam Hussein salam, all Muslims, in fact, are indebted to that. And, that's, and that was the reason we see that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt after Karbala have been spending a fortune very generously and have been promising rewards, rewards, abundant rewards for reviving the majalis of Abu Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam. Having said that briefly, like any other place that we attend, majalis al Husseini, as it is so rich with the rewards, remember that everywhere there is a rich promise rewards, there is at the same time very active satanic plots awaiting us. We got to be very careful on that. When you go to Hajj, because Hajj is so rich with the spirituality, the dose of the spirituality of Hajj is so high that once in your lifetime suffices to enable you to make your, your spiritual journey. 
unlike prayer that we needed every day, unlike fasting that we needed once a year, Hajj, you only it, imagine the medicine that it's so high in, and it's those that you take it only once in your lifetime. At the same time, Shaitan is very active there to make sure that you don't take that gem, the pressure, that pressure, uh, treasure that you have uh, gained in the Hajj, you don't take it back home. Likewise, in Majalis al Husseini, we have to be very careful, brothers and sisters. Shaitan is in an ambush, awaiting to take it from us, snatch it from us over the promised reward before I get home. How? If after the Majlis I use my tongue in a way that I'm not supposed to, eyes in a way that I'm not supposed to, hint is enough, I don't need to elaborate in it, hearing all the rest. Alhamdulillah, I'm so impressed here when I see that in every room, mashallah, there is a majlis for Imam Hussain alayhi salam. But at the same time, I can assume that there is a little bit of tension sometimes going on. As the nights go, we go ahead and more crowd are coming. Farsi speaking people, Arabic speaking people. And with all respect, elderly people, because we, have, we are a little bit of selfish. Because I'm Iranian, I want everything in Iranian, and I give preference to uh, the Farsi program. Arabic is speaking perhaps the same. The Swedish people, poor them, perhaps are in minority and they have to <laughs> compromise more than anywhere else. But what is important for us, we have to be very careful, is that no matter where we go, I came like earlier tonight and was listening to the uh, lecture of the brother. Unfortunately, I could not get anything from it. But I came only just to get some rewards. Because imagine of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. It really doesn't matter much whether I understand it or not. Inshallah, if I understand, that's much better. But even if I don't, does not mean that I don't attend it or I don't respect it. At the end of the day, it's a majlis for Imam Hussain alayhi salam. We've got to respect it. Any time that we come to such majlis, the first condition, the first criteria is the intention. For any worshiping act, please remember this. On the day of judgment, before they open the book of action of Sheikh Mansour, about talking with you tonight, they open the intention of Sheikh Mansour about this talk. Before, with all respect, you listening to, to my talk, before this, your attendance here is judged, the intention behind, behind attendance will be uh, decided upon. Niyatul mu'min khayrun min amalin. The intention of a believer is more important and better than his action. Imam Bagr was asked, why is it that the intention is better than the action? The Imam says, number one, because for my action, there could be elements of riya showing off. You don't know whether I'm talking for the sake of God or not. Huh? Nobody knows the intention. We can see the action and we judge people, as we usually say, we judge the books by, by the cover. But if the intention, the, there is no riya in the intention. Huh? I cannot show off about my intention because intention is not something to show off with. That's why niyatul mu'min khayrun man amal. The intention is better because the intention can be more pure and sincere than the action itself. This is number one. And number two, the Imam says that because at the end of the day, the ability of my action is limited. My knowledge is limited, my action and the physical ability that I have are very limited. Therefore, my action is limited. In this physical world, are so limited. But my intention has no limits. Because my intention is about my mind, my soul, unlimited. You can have intention for feeding the whole people on earth. Although in action, you cannot do that. So that's why niyatul mu'min khayrun min amale. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been advising Abu Zar al-Ghafari that Ya Abu Zar, liyakun laka fi kull amale niya. Ya Abu Zar, when you want to do something, make sure that whatever you do, you have an intention behind it. Hatta fil akla wa nawm. Even if you want to go to bed, even when you want to eat, I'm having this food so that I get some energy, inshallah, that I can worship God. I'm taking some rest so that I have some energy to get up for morning prayer and so forth. So brothers, remember that one of the first condition of attending Majalis al Husseini is before I step here to purify my intention and make sure, inshallah, this is because this is a majlis of ibadah, worshiping. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept to worship unless we are pure spiritually and physically. Make your wudu and attend the majlis of Imam Hussain and make sure, inshallah, we have a pure and sincere intention. That my intention of coming here to this 
house that is named after Imam Ali alayhi salam is nothing other than inshallah for the sake of God. If it's for the sake of God, there is no nationality issue for me. There is no, uh, you know, such issues that usually, unfortunately, some people sometimes we suffer from should not exist among us. So the first issue is the intention. And the second is a sadq. Sadq, it means that telling the truth, talking the truth. Sadq has levels. One is when it comes to words and talking. That when I'm talking, for me, it's for speakers very important. For those who are reading majalis, very important. Not to tell lies, not to add water into it. What we say, make sure that it's backed by proper references and we are telling the truth. And this is one level of it. The second level of it, in terms of action, all the companions of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, every one of them that was being martyred, the Imam was reciting this ayah of the Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم من المؤمنين رجال الصدق ما أحد الله عليه فمنهم من قطع نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا. Among the believers are those that they proved it true what they had the covenant that they had made with Allah. The covenant that they had made with Allah. The covenant, the promise that they had made with the Muhammad and the night before on the day of Ashura they proved it that yes, they were sincere and they were true in the promises that uh, they had made. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us also. The promise that we have made to Imam Hussain alayhi salam, to Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, with our action, we prove it, inshallah, true. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Perhaps tonight I, I noticed that the brother read Majlis for the Muslim Ibn Aqeel. Uh, and usually the first night is dedicated to Muslim Ibn Aqeel. Let me tonight mention another majlis, so that it's something uh, new added to that, inshallah. Talking about the first person who cried for Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Talking about the rewards of weeping and crying for Imam Hussain alayhi salam. You know that the first person in this world, among Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, who cried for Imam Hussain was the Holy Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, himself. Unlike any baby, every baby that is born, and the family of the baby, the grandparents of the baby, they feel happy that, alhamdulillah, we got a new baby or a grandchild, grandson. The Holy Prophet of Islam, before the birth of Imam Hussain had advised his auntie Safiye, who was uh, uh, helping Fatima to Zahra to give birth to Hussein. Uh, the Prophet had asked Safiye that once my uh, son Hussein is born, uh, wrap him into a white cloth and hand him over to me. So Safiye comes out and gives the good news of the, uh, of the birth of the second baby of Ali and Fatima alayhi salam. But she says that, Ya Rasulullah, let me just clean the baby and I soon bring him to you. The Prophet said that, what are you talking about? Cleaning my Hussain? God has purified them. Who are you to clean? Of course she was talking about something else, but anyway, she brought the baby to the Prophet. You now you imagine the scene. The Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his eyes of barzakh, and his inner senses were active, like all the Prophets. All Oliya Allah, their inner senses were active. That means they could see, hear, smell things that you and I would not. Yaqub, Prophet Jacob, from Canaan, from Palestine, he could smell the scent of the shirt of uh, of Yusuf. Huh? It's not something that ordinary people can can smell it. By the way, as soon as the Prophet of Islam saw the baby. Just born baby, Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. He was expected to be happy, to be seen happy, but they saw that the Prophet is in tears. And the Prophet was just rubbing the neck of Hussein ibn Ali. <laughs> he was hugging Hussein. The Prophet was hugging his grand, second grandson. Kissing, smelling the neck of Hussein ibn Ali. People who were around, they were wondering, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing? Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying? 
Ya Rasulallah, God has given you a second baby born, your grandson. The Prophet said, because I can see that my Hussein will be, will be cornered in Karbala. I can see when Shabar ibn Zerjaw shall join the soul of Allah Sadr. I can see when Shabar is sitting on the chest of my soul of Hussein. I can see when he is lady and when he is severing the head of my Hussein, and I can hear the cry of his sister Zainab, crying, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. The Prophet continues narrating the scene, and he says that in that very moment on that day, Hurul Eid, even in paradise, are striking themselves. People of paradise are weeping and crying, watching the sea. Ya Rasulallah, if that is what is happening to people of paradise, imagine the mother of this baby, how does she feel, Fatima to Zahra? And that's why the Prophet said, please don't cry loud. I don't want his mother to hear this story, because she's just given birth to her baby. But on the day of Ashura, in the evening of Ashura, people could cry, people of Ahlul Bay, they could hear the cry of a painful cry of a mother. <laughs> she was crying, Bulay, Bulay, Ya Hussein, my son. Allah, 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 صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا